Good evening and a very warm welcome to our IIE webinar today on digital policy diplomacy, the EU's digital policy relationship with the United States and the digital technology sector. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished uh, speaker today, Gerard de Graaf, who is the senior EU envoy for digital in the US and Silicon Valley. Good morning to you, Gerard. You're uh, on a different time frame than us. And we really give you a very warm welcome and thank you for taking the time to be with us out of your busy schedule. We appreciate it very much indeed. Gerard will speak to us for 20 to 25 minutes and then I will go to your audience for questions and answers. And you can see the question and answer function at the end of your Zoom question and answer session at the end of your screen. And please feel free to send in the questions during Gerard's presentation. And then I'll come back to you once he has finished. Will you, when you're sending in a question, really appreciate if you give your name and affiliation. As ever, today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And join us also on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. The European Commission under President van der Leyen has prioritised two twin policy agendas or pillars, the digital agenda and the green agenda. And in the past years, the EU advanced some significant regulations on data, the digital economy, including GDPR, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Service Act. And there are new regulatory actions to be adopted, as you know, for instance, the AI Act and the Data Act. So with the arrival of new regulations of data management and data business models and a general ambition in Europe to advance strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty, the appointment of Gerard uh, in September last as senior envoy of digital in the US is very, very timely. Any model of policy and market governance has advantages and of course disadvantages, both in EU member states, but also our relationship with global players like the digital technology sector and the United States of America. Gerard will discuss the importance of digital policy diplomacy and how the EU can change and engage with the US and with leading technology companies in order to address common challenges. He will focus particularly on the EU's Digital Markets Act and the EU's Digital Service Act. These two acts are landmark pieces of regulation which have been recently adopted by the EU to protect fundamental rights and enhance competition in digital markets. Gerard de Graaf has been at the heart of these developments uh, in the EU. He has worked for more than 30 years in the European Commission across a range of policy areas. Until his recent appointment, he was director of DG Connect, responsible for the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act. Previously, Gerard oversaw the EU's telecommunications, audiovisual policy, cyber policy, and the ICT standardization policy. He is also co-chairing two of the EU US Trade and Technology Council working groups on green tech, on data governance and technology platforms. Gerard, we really look forward to your presentation in what, as we said just before we came on, is a really exciting position. We look forward to, as I say, to your presentation. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Joyce, for the, the kind introduction. And I'm really pleased to be uh, with you today. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to set out, uh, I mean, after six months now that we have been here in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, um, how it's going. I mean, what kind of, uh, how, how my days are, are looking and what are the type of issues that we are discussing. Um, I mean, we're here in Silicon Valley, I think for the reasons that you outlined. I mean, the, the Silicon Valley, I mean, you read about, of course, uh, a little bit of headwinds and, and, and kind of uh, some, some introspection at the moment, but it, it is still a very dynamic, fast moving 
area region in the world where it's still a source of, of the new technologies that will kind of become very important in our societies, in our lives, in our economies like AI, like quantum, uh, cyber, uh, etc. So it is still uh, the place to be. And actually the question that I'm often asked here is like, well, why did it take so long for the European yeah. Union to come to Silicon Valley? I mean, uh, and, and as you may know, Joyce, we, we did have an, an office here mm. in the night. And then I don't know, somebody in its infinite wisdom decided that like in the early 1990s, this was the time to pack up and go home. Yeah. And this was, of course, it coincided with the time that Silicon Valley like took off, like never expected. And, and this is now kind of the leading technology hub not the only one in the world. So we're back uh, and probably we should have been back a, a, a little earlier. Um, and, and we're back, I think exactly because I mean, the European Union is of course um, quite active in the digital space. You mentioned the, the regulations. So yes, we will be and become, and we, we are the, the digital regulator of the world for many of the companies that have their headquarters here in Silicon Valley. And so it, it's important that we have a a relationship we have like a, a way to communicate not just in brussels with them but also like with the headquarters where you can get into a level uh, of of kind of um, responsibility that i mean in brussels we have lots of lobbyists of course mostly of them lawyers and, and they go into the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. legislation but here you can have a bit of a more strategic discussion yeah with leadership about like well where are they going and how can they kind of continue to contribute to our um, I mean prosperity and but but in a way that actually takes full account of our, our values and our, our fundamental uh, rights uh, so that, that I think is a very important part of what we are doing here and and then more widely I mean uh, so it's not just the region but also uh, California is, is, is quite a trailblazer in terms of mm. regulation I mean, uh, in the Congress uh, for reasons that I think you, you know uh, and not a lot is happening it's quite a polarized situation and, and that, that means that in practice actually most of the legislative activity in the US is, is taking place at state level and most of that is taking place in, in California and Sacramento. So that's also for us a quite important interlocutor. They have adopted yeah. a few years ago, like a GDPR type regulation okay. to protect yeah. data. They're very active into issues also around social media responsibility. Um, they're looking into AI, they're looking into cyber. Mm -hmm. So they're spending quite a bit of time also in, in Sacramento to talk with the assembly members there. But, but it isn't just all about regulation. It's okay. also the EU also wants to be a, a technology power. Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, issues around uh, sovereignty, technological mm -hmm. sovereignty. Uh, uh, we have, of course, experienced um, some uh, concerns. I mean, some issues uh, in terms of supply chains that did not work well uh, because of COVID, uh, the dependencies that have been built up in our economic uh, systems. Uh, and, and Europe, if there's one lesson that we've learned over, say, since the last couple of years is we need to be standing more on our own feet. Mm. And so we, we cannot just become a consumer or a user of technologies, we need to continue to be also a producer of technologies and, and, and also a producer of like the technologies that we believe are trustworthy and, and kind of uh, support our, our, our kind of economic and, and social models like in AI uh, or in, in, in other uh, technologies. So that's another opportunity we have here is to work very closely with US industry, I mean, to facilitate cooperation with EU industry to work on kind of standard setting and joint projects, uh, for example, in in AI or, or, or digital twins. So this is a little bit our kind of uh, set of responsibilities. Um, I, I think it fits into this broader digital diplomacy trends, I mean, because we're not the only ones here. The EU is, has now, I mean, it, it kind of with me as a senior envoy, but quite a few member states and also kind of third countries have tech ambassadors in Silicon Valley. So you see that, that trend. I mean, diplomacy has changed quite fundamentally as a profession 
over the last say five to ten years in, mm. in the past it used to be quite focused on security issues on trade issues i mean look at the issues that the eu is dealing with at the moment i mean the, in, in terms of like the crisis that we are dealing with I mean, we have a climate crisis we have an immigration or crisis challenge we have a, a, a digital i mean internet type of of, of crisis uh, i mean health water i mean energy um, so the, the, the say the, the the job description of the average diplomat is a lot different from what yeah. it used to be in the past so this mm. is I've now translating particularly for the EU and, and I'm, I mean I'm here we've set up this office in San Francisco it's the only country in the world where the EU has another office outside of the capital but it could okay. become yeah. I mean, maybe in India or China in the future we might see that same model but we have about 120 delegations around the world. I mean, we are training up our diplomats to kind of be much more conversant in uh, digital technologies, in regulation, uh, also in, in kind of issues around environment, climate change, sustainability, issues around migration, uh, around health, around access to water. So, so that I think is also, it's a bit of like a, a consequence of that more uh, rapid uh, approach towards diplomacy because the European Union like as a leader also in tech but definitely of course in regulation uh, mm -hmm. we have an interest as we have seen with the GDPR for kind of our rules to be taken seriously around the world and where possible also of course copied uh, by, by, by countries we are in effect in some kind of I mean there's different models if I go back to digital about like how, how you use digital in your societies and there's the European model very much human centered uh, the digital for good digital for people not the other way around not not digital for profits uh, is, is, is the motto uh, has been the motto here in Silicon Valley and still is to a large extent uh, so that's the model that we have then you have a US model which is more like the laissez-faire market driven mm -hmm. model it's changing a little bit, at least in terms of like how people discuss, uh, like in the Trade and Technology Council, we have a lot of discussions with the US and, and we do see eye to eye on the direction. Uh, we, 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 we agree on like, well, how technology should kind of be, be embedded in our societies. The, the, the difference is that we managed to translate these kind of uh, uh, concepts and, 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 and directions of policy into legislative activities. Whereas the US for reasons that are connected to the US political system uh, mm. does not manage or has not managed so far and it does not look good for the immediate future to translate kind of say the, the, the common um, sense of direction into, into action. And then you have a third model which is the, we call it the, the repressive, the, uh, the, the model, the authoritarian model, eh? using digital technologies for suppressing um, freedoms. I mean, the, the, the Chinese model, the Russian model, the Turkish model, they're all like variation of that same theme. And then if you look at the rest of the world, you look at Africa, you look at Latin America, you look at Asia, of course, a lot of countries are now struggling with the questions that the European Union has been struggling with. How do we keep the internet safe? Um, and mm. and uh, I mean, they have different models now to look at. Uh, and, and we would like, together with the US countries, of course, to opt for like the more human rights based democratic mm. model. And, and that's where we try to kind of show them which is, I think, is very essential, of course, also in diplomacy. Uh, I mean, the lead that the European Union is taken on climate change, the lead that the European Union is taken on digital, the lead that the European Union taken is on, on, on other issues as well. We have to show to the rest of the world that these are winning formulas, uh, that if you do this, you can actually have a successful economy. I mean, we are like, if you take climate change, the European Union accounts for less than 10% of CO2 emissions um, mm. globally. So if we do everything right in the world, we, we can only affect the 10%. We can maybe get the 10% to like 5% or, 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 yeah. or even low. But success requires that we convince other countries that they should follow our lead. And, and we can only do so if we show that this is not going to make us poorer. 
it, it is going yeah. to lead to a, a, a prosperous economy. It's going to kind of support uh, our values. Our, our, I mean, it, it, and, and then others will say, hey, this is interesting. And, and, and kind of we, we might wish to follow in the footsteps of the European Union because it can help us become a more prosperous, a more inclusive, a more sustainable type of society. So that's like what behind. I mean, you, you can mm. be a diplomat, but if you have like, if you have no results to show for, if you say, look, follow yeah. us, and then people look and there's nothing, or actually it's negative, you're you're you are not going to be very successful in, in, in kind of making your your case. So so that everything hangs kind of everything is is related. Well, we're here now in San Francisco since, since six months. We are actually co-located with the Irish Consulate General, which is a, an absolute yes. pleasure. Uh, yes. With Michal Smith, uh, the consul, the Irish Consul General, and his team. I mean, we've been we are so grateful to him and to the other consul consulate general here because, of course, we were the new kit in town, literally. Yeah. And we've had a lot of support from our member states here to kind of help us to make connections and build up networks to tell us like um, one of the things they told me for example was never wear a tie yes. uh, don't, don't use your brussels attire and, and go to meetings <laughs> in the valley because they will immediately conclude that you haven't understood them you don't fit in uh you're it's an interesting outsider. yeah <laughs> literally so uh, I, I i i was always wearing a tie in brussels so i'm not, of course, not yeah. um, but we're very grateful to our our member states i think we've been welcomed also by the community here. Uh, I think the, the time is right for the kind of discussion that we're trying to bring to Silicon Valley is how can we keep the internet safe? I mean, how can we keep the internet open and competitive, the markets open and competitive, whilst at the same time, of course, ensuring that we, we secure our, our democracies, our fundamental freedoms, our values. We kind of make sure that also the markets remain fair i think that that there is a debate about this in silicon valley the people are open they are eager actually to debate these issues in in in, in kind of uh, the wake of quite a few scandals that have happened i think also these companies recognize that whilst they bring fantastic innovations to the market uh, let's not forget mm -hmm. uh, there's also a downside there's a dark side to 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 the internet to social media platforms mm. with uh, illegal content, uh, with uh, disinformation, uh, yeah. harmful, I mean, har I mean uh, kind of harmful content, uh, hate speech, uh, or dangerous products that you can buy on marketplaces, counterfeit products you can buy on marketplaces. I think the companies recognize that not all good, not all is good on the Western front um, mm. in, in the US and that they need to step up their game. And, and actually, I think what the EU is bringing with the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act, even though it, it creates some concerns in the minds uh, also of, of the, like the, the, the top level here, particularly mm. the DMA, maybe the DMA more than the DSA. I think the fact that we set some, I mean, the, the, the very fashionable word here in, in Silicon Valley in the US is guardrails. I'd not oh, heard, yes. that. Yeah. I've heard the word guardrails in Europe, but then as we yeah. regard <laughs> A motorway, uh, yeah. but the fact that the EU is setting some guardrails, some it's, rules of the road, is generally welcomed. Yeah. The DSA is very much about safety on the internet. So mm -hmm. how do we make sure that kind of there's no, I mean, the, the illegal content is addressed, is, is avoided as much as possible, disinformation. I think there is, um, I mean, a greater alignment with the industry here, the companies here, because that's also what they want themselves. Uh, no company, mm. your, your Meta or your Amazon or your, your TikTok, I mean, they, you, you do not want to become a purveyor of illegal content and, and mm. hate speech. I think we've seen a bit with Twitter that kind of when the content moderation changed mm. with Twitter, a lot of the advertisers were saying, well, I'm not sure Twitter is still a safe place to place my advertisement because I don't want to see my advertisement next to hate speech, for example. So, yeah. so here there is, I think, a strong alignment between what the platforms want and, and what the regulation requires. And of course, the devil is in the detail. It sets out a systemic approach. So we're actually taking a lot of inspiration from banking regulation 
Uh, the, the, the truth is the, the, the internet companies are becoming regulated industry. Uh, that's the, I mean, however you turn it, that's the reality. Like financial industry is a regulated industry. The pharmaceutical industry is a regulated industry. The energy industry is a regulated industry in, in uh, transport and the mobility. So they are a regulated industry, but we are looking at it a bit like with the, and, and the regulator is the European Commission for the very large online platform, which is also changed now, because it used to be the member state. I mean, Ireland used to be a very lead regulator as it still is, mm -hmm. for example, for the GDPR. Now for the very large online platforms under the DSA, the European Commission will become the regulator. Mm. Uh, so, and, and in the next couple of weeks, you will see the first designations because we will need to designate these companies so that they know that they are within yeah. the scope and, and, and they will have to comply with the, the rules and regulations in the Digital Services Act. So, but the way we're going to implement that regulation is very much like the way banking regulators implement banking regulations. So we look at systems, to kind of how robust are the systems? I don't think we have, uh, I mean, we are not under no illusion. I mean, there will always be a pro problems like with illegal content because we're not stopping the content at the door. Uh, we are not saying you have to um, do ex ante monitoring of content before it can be uploaded by the users. That is not practical but it is also kind of in violation of our fundamental rights. So there will be some illegal content that will be uploaded because we have like, I mean, there's users here who have bad intentions and they will upload illegal content or disinformation or, 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 or offer dangerous products. The, 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 the kind of the requirement of the Digital Services Act is that these platforms have systems in place that allow them to detect early illegal content Mm. then uh, uh, remove it when they can and, and also, of course, prevent um, these the illegal content from, from surfacing on their platform. So here, I think we are more or less aligned and we will look at the systems and we have put elements in place which will help also social media companies, for example, to detect, I mean, notice and action. So you and I and, 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 and I mean anybody can if we see something on the social media platform we can say look we think there's a problem with that content hmm. please check it out and if you find indeed it's illegal or it infringes your terms and conditions then please remove it we, we are giving a right to act to researchers to access platform data so they can look under the hood uh, so that's that we, we're asking platforms to do risk assessments they will undergo independent external audits. If you're a marketplace, you have to do due diligence on uh, know your business customer. I mean, uh, so also terms that I think we're quite familiar with from, from the um, financial regulations. So that's the DSA. On the DMA, it's a little bit, I mean, we, we are defining unfair practices in the Digital Markets Act. I mean, the internet is, is, is all about scale and speed. Right? It's network effect. So you, what you see typically in the internet is that a few companies are growing very fast, very big and become very powerful. Uh, that's what we've seen across kind of the different sectors, whether it's um, app stores, whether it's uh, social media companies, whether it's marketplaces, uh, and, and so th the reality is, is that these companies are so powerful that they can set the rules of the road. They can, I mean, there's an asymmetric relationship. They can impose conditions on users um, that kind of rely on them, like marketplaces, if you are a third party yeah. seller. Well, good luck if you want to sell and, and, and kind of ignore uh, Amazon, for example. I mean, uh, Amazon is a very big player. And so if you're not on Amazon, you deny yourself uh, an important opportunity to reach uh, a part of your potential customer base. So, so what you see is that there are particular practices that these companies have engaged in, which we would regard, or, or the, the legislature has, regards as unfair. So basically, what the DMA, the Digital Markets Act says, if you want to do business, you are very welcome in the European Union, but, but you don't do this. Uh, if you want to play, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, I mean, I'm a great sports fan. It's like the, the football or soccer, as they say here, it's not Gaelic football that we yeah. play. If, if you want to play football, like we know it in, in Europe, 
don't play in, in a way that kind of uh, breaks the rules. So, so we're kind of clearly setting out that certain practices are not allowed. You cannot self-preference. If you're yeah. a company like Amazon, you can't use the information that you have about third-party sellers to outcompete them. That's unfair. If you are a, an app store like Apple, you can't build a walled garden that prevents people from kind of downloading apps from outside of your app store, from other app stores, or, or, no. or even from the internet. You, um, if you are kind of a, a, a social media company or a marketplace company, you cannot impose certain types of kind of payment systems and say this is the only one you can use. Uh, so there are in in the digital market sector, but. 20 or so practice that we say look no more or obligation mm -hmm. uh, if you if you are kind of really big uh, and others want to compete with you you need to give access to data that you have because data is a, is of course an important part of your competitive strength and your the leverage you've got over the market so if you want to restore a bit the, the, the balance of competition in the eu you will have to kind of give access to, to data to your, your competitors. So, so those are kind of the kind of requirements that, of course, companies don't like. Yeah? So if right. I ask companies here, like, well, DSA, DMA, what do you think? They will say, well, we think DSA is pretty good. We like it. DMA, not so sure, because we right. think that's kind of uh, not necessarily uh, compatible with, with what has made us so successful in this, uh, in this space. Maybe uh, a few words about, say, the, the, the global effects of this or the effects yeah. here on the US. The US is not regulating in this space a little bit. Yeah. So what you will get effectively, and this is going to create an interesting dynamic in the US, and to put it in a, in a quite kind of uh, bold way, I mean, the US EU citizens will be better protected than American citizens that are getting services from American companies. Okay. Uh, and if that's in the DMA, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, Apple hasn't yet said how it will implement, as by way of example, how it will implement the Digital Markets Act. But it, it might well be that they will set up an app store for Europeans, for Europe, uh, because they will, I mean, there are certain requirements in the DMA which are not compatible with the way the app store works at the moment. So either they would have to kind of modify their app store for everybody in the world. Or they will just set up an app just store which meets the kind of the, the requirements mm -hmm. in Europe and then leave the app store that they have in place for the rest of the world. It, it, it might be that they do the latter, that they will set up an app store for Europeans, in which case, Europeans, if you have an Apple device, you can download from other app stores. There might be new app stores. We expect a lot of innovation to come. So there mm. might be specialized app stores, maybe an app store for games, mm. maybe app stores for health applications, for other types of applications. So you can download on your iPhone apps from outside of the app store environment. Quite likely, you will not be subject to the 30% charge that yeah. Apple takes. If you download from the web, definitely you won't be subject to that 30% charge. So I would imagine that Americans here are going to ask themselves, as if Why? they find out about this, like, yes. <laughs> how can this be that Europeans are getting better treatment yeah. from American companies than American citizens get from American companies? So th that might create an interesting dynamic. Yes. And then we have to see what happens around the world. You are familiar with the Brussels effect. The GDPR having been adopted by quite a few countries around the world, um, we would expect the DSA and the DMA also to act as a source of inspiration. The DSA and the DMA are very comprehensive pieces of legislation. I mean, you need a lot of regulatory capacity to implement a piece of legislation like the DSA and the DMA. It's not easy, uh, but they could I mean certain parts could be implemented of the DSA and the DMA. We have a lot of dialogue, which I mean, when I was in Brussels about, about kind of more than six months ago, in, uh, 20, 30% of my time was, was spent on discussing with Japan, Korea, Australia, Canada, I mean, the countries in Latin America and in, in Southeast Asia about the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act. Because of course, if we get a competitive advantage, which we believe we will get, compared to Americans, we will also get that same competitive advantage compared to, to, to the Japanese yeah. 
the South Koreans. So, so there's going to be an interesting dynamic as these, these uh, laws are kind of uh, implemented, maybe in practical terms. And then I, I conclude it, it, the DSA is, I mean, it's in force, but it's not yet in application. We would, I mean, the companies had to submit or publish uh, data about their user numbers because we're looking at very large online platforms and very large online search engines with more than 10%, serving more than 10% of the EU population, so 45 million users. Um, 17 February was the date when this, this mm -hmm. information had to be published. And now we're looking and we're preparing for designations of these companies in the next couple of weeks. And then four months later, the, uh, the, the, the law will enter into application. So from that point on, so if it's mid-March, say end March, we're talking mid-July, end July, when the, the, the Digital Services Act for the very large online platforms and the very large online services will uh, start to apply in practice. And, and also by that time, for example, they will need to submit to us their risk assessment. So they will need to look at their services and, and, and make a determination to what extent their services, their facilities can, uh, can be abused or, or, or can kind of uh, produce risks to our society uh, across a, a number of areas. I mean, uh, risk, for example, for spreading illegal content, but also risk for gender violence, protection of minors, disinformation, etc. So, so by the time that the, the, the legislation enters into application, we will need to receive already these risk assessments. Uh, so, so action is needed. I mean, these companies are very, very busy preparing. I mean, the context that we've had, confirms that there's serious engagement at the level of social media companies here in Silicon Valley. And but but so the, the law will start to apply in about four months time. Mm. The Digital Markets Act is a little bit further down the road. Uh, I would say one year from now, the Digital okay. Markets Act will enter into application. There's a number of steps in the meantime. Uh, by the beginning of May, we will need to uh, receive from the likely gatekeepers, so the very big companies, because the scope is only only very big companies. So between ten and fifteen, maximum twenty companies will be in scope. Uh, so beginning of May, they need to send us uh, the data, and, and then kind of by after the summer, say around September, they'll be designated, and then six months later, so say beginning of March, around this time next year, the Digital Markets Act will start to uh, apply. I mean, there's lots more to say, but maybe stop here for questions. I, mean, I haven't talked about AI, I haven't talked about se semiconductors. There's lots more to, to say, yeah. but that's my course yeah. here for.